Final class on the hierarchy. We started down here with the basic process control system, 3P3, and then we looked at uh, what we need to control, unstable, safety-related variables. Then we looked at alarms. They're activated, but people have to respond. So this is automated. This is manual. Now we have the safety instrumented systems. These are the aggressive shutdown systems. Look at variables and decide whether we should shut down part of the process. Now we're going to look at relief systems and a little bit about containment. So the relief and the SIS, when, they sh when, when they're going to take action, generally speaking, we're going to divert the material that we're processing somewhere else. So we'll get into containment just a little bit. Another picture of our hierarchy. <coughs> These three levels of hierarchy require electrical power. So, electrical power fails, we're in trouble. So, we're going to talk about the relief system and then we'll go containment. We're going to talk about where we locate in the process the unique relief system. What kind of equipment's available? We introduced that last class. A little bit on how you decide between the different kinds of equipment, how you document the drawings, and how you figure out the maximum capacity. What's the maximum flow rate you're going to have to process for that equipment? I'm just going to show a few equations. I'm not going to go through the details of the calculations. You can find that in lots and lots of books. Okay, so pressure relief. So, we obviously have some limited strength for every piece of equipment that we have. We never want to get to that limit. So before we reach that limit of force and stress on, on the vessel, we want to, or the pipe, whatever it happens to be, we want to be able to stop the process and in some cases divert the material someplace else. As I mentioned before, we also have to protect against a vacuum. It could be unexpected. So I don't have it here, but there's a nice picture of a big penicillin reactor. And these things are several stories high, big stainless steel vessels. And it's normally run at about atmospheric pressure, full of mostly water, a little bit of biomaterials to generate the penicillin. How could that get a vacuum? Well, it, it has to be sanitized. So every once in a while, they flush the, the reactor, and they sanitize it. They put in some caustic, and then they put in steam. Well, if you don't put in enough steam, you put it in too fast, what happens? You put in some steam, the vessel's cold, then what happens? The steam condenses, you pull a vacuum, and the whole vessel just collapses in. You wouldn't think about something like that. But if you did that once, your boss would remember you. That's his life. So vacuums can occur when you don't expect them. There's lots of nice pictures on the internet about the tanks that have been imploded. OK. So uh, naturally, we want it, we'd like to prevent these pressure uh, excursions from occurring, but we know for all these reasons of equipment failure, human failure, all kinds of things, they're going to happen. They're going to happen. Maybe only once every five or ten years, but once every five or ten years if you kill someone, that's pretty dramatic. Okay, so the benefits are safety, environmental protection, making this stuff, reduced insurance, and compliance with governmental code. So for pressure vessels, there are, there are laws. Not just the guidelines that are laws that you need to follow. So, how do we know where to do this? Well, we're going to get some guidelines, and then as we go through the process with our hazards and operability study, which will be the next class, not the workshop, but the next class, we'll have the hazards and operability study, we'll identify these locations. So, we're going to give you the guidelines today, and you'll apply them in this HAZOP study. Generally, any closed vessel, any closed vessel 
that can be entirely shut off. All the inputs and all the outputs can be shut off. Needs pressure relief. Now, if there's a valve, if there's a pipe coming out of this vessel and there's a valve, and there's a big sign on it that says, don't close this valve, that sign doesn't count. Somebody can close that vessel. And the minute there's a valve there, that means that this vessel can be closed and we need pressure relief. If it's an automatic control valve and it's a fail open control valve, you could say, well, it should never, it can't close because it's a fail open control valve. It doesn't count. The control system can close <coughs> that valve, so you have to have pressure relief on the system. The only way would be if there are like two vessels and there's a pipe connecting the two of them and it's a big pipe, big diameter pipe, then you can put pressure relief on one and not on the other. If there's any kind of potential restriction in that pipe, then you have to put pressure relief on both of those vessels. Because remember, this is the last resort. We've worked our way up to the top. Okay, just to go back over this again, remember the, the safety valve was one way. Here's the, the pressure, here's the vessel. And so the pressure A is it's getting higher and higher. It's going to push up against this spring and then it's going to relieve out from pad B. Okay. So how can we adjust the pressure of the spring? The, the, the strength, the force of the spring. Look at that. There's a nut right up in the top, right? So we can twist this nut and we can adjust the pressure of the spring. So we can set this at some range. And if it's, we can't set it to any range, we're going to have to have the proper spring, but then we can fine tune it with that little nut. So we can do either vapor or liquid or two phase. Here's a picture of a safety valve. So here's the, the vessel down here. We're going to come up against the flange on the vessel. And we take, here's the pipe going up, sending it out to some place for disposal. <coughs> it's, here's the spring. It's got a nice little handle here. It's that handle for carrying it, in case you want to carry it from class to class. What's the handle for? I suppose the handle's here. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You can test it. So you pull this handle up, and that will open the safety valve. So you can make sure that it's not corroded. Because right now, this is, a, this is not a real valve. We can look inside. This is a real valve. We can't look inside. We can't see if there's corrosion and that, that uh, the, the plug has, has corroded and it's stuck now to the, to the seat of the valve and, and it won't open. So, so we can test this valve. Just taking that thing and jerking it up. So uh, that's the safety valve. Just remember, a pressure disc, the first diaphragm, is a metal device that we insert in the pipe. And it's the weak link. It's the weakest part of the mechanical system. It's engineered to break at a certain point. So you have to buy these discs from the manufacturer. Here's what they look like. You can kind of see the scoring here to make sure it's going to break at a certain point. Here's installed with the two flanges on it. Okay. So these are the rupture discs. Once they break, they don't reseat, so you're going to have to shut down the process and, and replace them. Okay, one more detail on the on the valves. There are two kinds, two general kinds, a conventional and a balanced. Now, what's the difference? Here's the pressure in the vessel. As I start to in increase this pressure, at some point the, the, the valve will get lifted up. Now, what's going to happen? The force is here now pushing against this valve, the, the spring. Now, when I start to release fluid, the material is going to flow out this direction. Now, if this is a very long pipe, let's say it's going a half a mile that direction, which is silly, it's not going to happen. 
then the pressure here is going to start building up. Okay. Now the pressure here is going to be operating to push to close the valve. So we're going to have the pressure in the vessel pushing up this way and the pressure in this relief chamber pushing back down this way. Okay. Now, so we probably do not use this valve if this pressure is going to change a lot once it starts to open. So if there's a, a, a large back pressure to have that flow going in this direction, then that back pressure is going to come and, and try to close the valve while the pressure in the vessel is trying to open the valve. So we're going to use this conventional valve when the path between the safety valve and its final release is short. The ballast valve does not allow the vapor to get on top of the the valve seat. So you can see there, these are bellows, and these are like little accordions here on each side. So now as the as the fluid flows up through here and goes out in this direction, this whole thing gets pushed up, and we're not going to get the pressure from the gas, the relieving gas, come back on the other side and try and close the valve. So if this pressure starts to get high because we have a lot of resist flow resistance then we would probably use a balanced valve because it's going to open as, and it's not going to then start to close again because this pressure goes up. People see that? So conventional and balanced. Small pressure drop, conventional, large pressure drop, balanced. Good question. Yes? Uh, if there's no pressure going into the, the upper section, why is there a pen? What's that pen well, well, we just want, this is always going to be atmospheric pressure, is what we're saying. So, if we close it off, then we start compressing the gas up here. And then we kind of, then we build up the pressure. Okay? So that just means, the vent is so, we have a constant pressure. Okay, good. Yes? So, is this type of technique is system, how do you know if it has Okay, how, how do you know, well, first of all, we can do that. We can test it occasionally, okay? So, we test somebody who breaks the valve. <coughs> well, something, okay, there's two things. Hopefully, there's not a terrorist, although, in the last few years, we have to think about that. I mean, as chemical engineers now, you're going to also review your plans for terrorism as well as everything else, which is not part of this course, but... Really, some of this will apply. There can occasionally be vandalism, an unhappy worker, and that's very difficult to deal with. Right? It's, almost, it's very difficult to break this valve. But what can happen, what can happen is the valve can leak. That's the bad thing. So you, you really can't get in here and force it shut. But you can have a valve that leaks. Now, how can you tell if the valve is leaking? Because if 1% of your product is going out and, and we're losing 1% of the product, that could be your entire profit. If you don't sell that, it's just going off it. So how do we know that the valve is leaking? It's going to be a very small flow. So one way would be to put a flow meter in, but the flows are going to be so small, the leak, that it's going to be hard to measure. Sometimes what we do is we'll put a, a, a thermocouple here, so we'll measure the temperature. So if this, if this material here is, is anything different from ambient, when it leaks, we, we can measure the temperature here and see that it's either colder than it should be or hotter than it should be. So the typical way that we'll check the leaks is, is to measure the temperature. We could also put in a, a small pitot tube in. Again, small leaks will, will have trouble measuring. On a pressure vessel, do you want one of these valves or a couple? Okay, so pressure leak. Um, that depends. You have one big one. So, for example, the boilers here at McMaster have several. So, instead of having one big uh, pressure relief valve, when that goes off, the neighbors get mad because it really makes a sound. You can have a series of pressure relief valves at slightly different pressures. 
So if you have a small excursion in pressure, you open the first one. Then if the pressure gets higher again, you'll open the second one. So quite often you'll have several at different set points so that you minimize that explosive noise. Okay. Now, then should you have more than one, depends upon the severity of the accident. And so uh, in most pieces of equipment, these are highly reliable pieces of equipment, so we're only going to have one. But for example, in the boilers, we do have multiple. Here, I mean, master. So if you, if you do the tour, you go all the way up to the roof. Just before you get on the roof, there's a little room there, and that's where the safety, the safety belt is. But they're not, I mean, that doesn't release the steam into the room. By the way, let's remember, you know, steam is benign, except if you're in the room with the steam, you get cooked. So you make sure you pipe it, even if it's, if it's a benign material, you pipe it somewhere where people can't walk. You don't put it, you know, a pipe sticking out here on a walkway going by, so if somebody happens to be unlucky, boom, that's not good. So make sure, and things like that have happened. You know, so yeah, because the, the, the pipe fitters here are going, oh, it's pretty convenient, put the pipe here, I don't have to get up on the ladder. No, no, no. Okay, some uh, for the relief valve, what's good and what's bad. So for almost any piece of equipment, when you're thinking about it, you need selection criteria. What, what kind of pump or what kind of heat exchanger. You gotta know what, what are the advantages and disadvantages. So a simple, low cost, you can buy them, okay? The main advantage, regain normal process operation rapidly. Right? That's the key one, that's the main advantage. When the pressure goes down, the spring closes again. Disadvantages, it can leak. Okay, so it can leak, so we have to, we don't want to keep opening and closing the valve. So nobody's going to come along every day and test the valve, because every time you test it, there's a chance it's not going to seat properly and you're going to start to leak. You can put a little O-ring in there, which is a little expandable uh, washer, if you think about that. It's not for very high pressures, not above 20,000 PSI, and we have processes higher than that, so we won't, won't be using uh, safety valves for those. And this is an important point. When, when engineers think about safety, they say, well, I can't go wrong if I make the equipment really big, but you can. So we've got the pipe coming out, and I'm the safety valve, right? and I'm too big. And this is too big a safety valve, so the, basically the orifice here is too big. So what happens? It builds up pressure, and then it pushes, pushes the spring back. Now it's so big, this opening is so big, that the, all the gas gushes out. Then, then the valve shuts. Now the pressure builds up again, and it pushes my hand back, all the gas runs out, and it shuts again. So what happens? It's going to do this, and as, as it keeps hitting, opening and closing, it's going to shatter. So if you put too big a safety valve on, it can destroy itself in a few seconds. Just going up and down, banging like that. So you got to size it properly, not just too big. So that's a potential uh, downside. Okay, so the burst diaphragms, advantages, no leakage. Come down here. If it does leak though, if it fails, it fails to a safe position. Right? So if there's some corrosion, some acid in there or something, and it leak, it, it, it starts to get corroded, there'll be a hole punched in it, and so that goes safe. Whereas the safety valve, if it's corroded, this we could actually build up a seal here, a mechanical seal, so it won't open properly. So it handles corrosion a lot better. It can release a lot of material in very large volumes. It can handle slurries, vis uh, viscous material, sticky material. There's no, you know, this valve now is not going to work well if it has something that can clog up the valve. Whereas if we have a nice straight pipe, uh, we can get more material out and be more reliable. The disadvantages is that much, much shut down the process, and we're, we're going to have a large one. And it has a slightly poorer accuracy. So we're going to use these for high pressures and for nasty materials. 
very, very large volumes. Right. How do we show them on diagrams, the piping and instrumentation diagrams? <coughs> this is the safety valve. So this is the spring. The idea of the picture is this is the spring, and this is an angle valve, so it changes 90 degrees in the direction. And out goes the effluent. Before the rupture disc, we can either use that. Sometimes it's shown as this. Sometimes it's shown as that. There's lots of different symbols for the rupture disc. Okay. All right, so let's go through some examples. We need that. Where are we going to put a safety valve or a rupture disc on this process? Where and then which one of the two? This is, by the way, this is ethane propane, butane, and pentane coming in here. Overhead comes out the ethane, the methane, and the, a little bit of ethane, I think, and the rest comes out the bottom. So it's a clean, light hydrocarbon. carbon. So talk to your friends for 30 seconds, and then we'll discuss where we put it and which one of the two devices we put. <coughs>
So it's not above 20,000 PSI. Yeah, 20,000 PSI. So we're going to have, we can put it on this pipe. Because this is, this is an open path, we can put it on this pipe, or we can put it as a separate hole in the vessel, which costs more money. Safety valve. Let's look at another one. Positive displacement pump. What's the principle behind a positive displacement pump? Let's look at a couple of different kinds of positive displacement pumps. So, a piston. We suck some fluid in here, the piston goes back, and then the piston comes down, pushes down, displaces that liquid which goes out this way. Okay. Positive displacement. So we suck some fluid in and then push the piston down and out it goes. So that would be a piston type positive displacement pump. Those are in use in the process industries. We can have a gear pump. It sucks in some liquid and then captures that volume of liquid and pushes it through to the other side. So there's no slippage here. There's, that pump's going around and there's no slippage. In a centrifugal pump, you can stick your finger in the pump and let it go around and you won't damage your finger. You may not believe me, Professor Dunn is going to do that in one of the workshops later on in the semester. And we'll see if his finger gets sheared off. Okay. But you couldn't do that here. We, there's one of 342. But in this pump, it's grabbing the liquid, and there's no slippage. If I put my finger in there, I would, you know, I'd be like, like this in a second. There's, there's no slippage. It grabs the liquid, the fluid, and it pulls it around. That's a gear pump. There's a, a low pump. All right, so the principle of all three of these is when it's operating, this would be centrifugal, one of those, these are the gear of the load, it grabs that whole volume of liquid and pushes it through. There's no give. Okay? So what would happen if I had that pump, I had a motor driving that pump, and I closed that valve? Yeah, you have a huge force for a second, and then something's going to give. We damage the pump, right? Because this thing's going around, it's grabbing incompressible liquid and pushing it with a high force in through that pipe. So if I close that valve, immediately the pump is going to be damaged. Probably what would happen is the connection between the motor and the pump, the coupling would break. Hopefully that's the least of what would happen. Okay, so how do we, so let's think about using safety relief. Basically what we're saying is we have huge pressure build up here. <coughs> what are we gonna do? Take 30 seconds, we're talking to a friend. What are we gonna do about this? This example, by the way, you can find it in Bartek. So we're working on Bartek, find it in Bartek. <coughs> I know. Okay, where do we need a relief device? Where? Yes. Between the pump and the valve. Don't put it in the wrong side of the valve. That doesn't do any good. You get a pump and the valve. What kind of device? It's a clean liquid. Safety valve. And where would we exhaust? Where do we where do we send the material? Right back into the tank. You don't have to waste anything here. So we'll take a safety relief valve and we'll push it right back into the tank. Yes. Could there be a difference with the centrifugal pump? Yeah. So you can you can dead end the centrifugal pump for a short period of time, have no flow, 
and it won't damage it. So typically what we would do with a centrifugal pump is if there is a minimum flow here, some pumps have sort of a minimum flow to prevent too much heating up and, and you get some recycling in it. We can measure the flow rate and have a control valve send it back. So we have a little flow control that would set, make sure that a minimum amount of liquid would go around. And if it, did, if it delayed a second or two seconds, it wouldn't damage the pump because there's slippage in the centrifugal pump. Whereas this thing, there's no slippage. It's going to break. It's going to break fast. Is there a question back here? Now, like, not every pad is going to be able to afford that in every situation, right? So. Oh, no, safety. Well, no, what I'm saying is there's, there's other ways you could design that to circumvent having to deal with that. Right. But if you're going to have a pump, you're almost always going to have a valve here. Because at least during shutdown, you have to stop the flow. So almost every positive displacement pump is going to have some valve somewhere at the outlet. And then you're going to need some protection on that valve. Okay. That's, that's the problem. You get into it. Now, some companies don't do that. But we saw a whole bunch of examples, you know, that first class of where companies didn't do things right. Next Monday, we're going to see, at the workshop, we're going to see another example where a very big company that should have known better didn't do some things right. So, so if you're going to have a positive displacement pump, you're probably going to, you've got to have a valve in. Okay? Once you put that valve in, it can be closed. Now, the only thing you can do is you put a very weak coupling on the, on the motor, and then you protect that coupling so when it breaks, it doesn't shatter and hit somebody. That's, that's really plus the engineering stuff. And it's not that expensive. The safety valve's not that expensive. I meant to, with the flow and the control valve, but that's not achieved. Like that there, that, set, that setup should be probably achieved for a, a, a good price, but like, you're putting in a control system with a flow meter. Yeah, but we don't have a flow meter, so this could be a monitor. This could be this could be a small flow. It could be a metering pump, where the actual speed of the pump gives you sets the flow rate, so you don't need a flow meter. So that's the Bartek case, where they don't have a meter; they just have a metering pump, and that's injecting a certain small amount of fluid in. So one of the reasons to use positive displacement is that gives you an actual meter because you're grabbing the fluid, and you know you can calculate how much fluid you're. you're flowing by how fast this is going around. So you can use a metering pump, and that means you don't have a flow meter and you don't have a control pump. That could be cheaper. Yeah. There's a question over here. I'm just wondering, when is it not appropriate to use um, a digital safety system? Like if you just had um, like a digital controller, like a switch that would just turn off the motor, rather than having this pressure safety valve that would just pull it awkward. OK, so that's this level. Right, so, that, so basically, you're at this level here. You're suggesting you could use a, a, something that's electronic <coughs> that would require some power and could then, open, open, say, open that valve and recycle. Yes, that would be, and that would be more expensive. Say, not, not opening a valve, no, like no recycle. I'm saying, what, what, when, when, is it not, when is it appropriate to recycle like you're saying, or physically have a switch, like a high pressure switch, that just cuts the power of the pump? No okay, recycle. Well, the high pressure switch is an SIS. That's going to cut the power of the pump. Okay. So, if you're going to have a high pressure though, that that's a mechanical device that can fail. Okay. So then you need this layer. So so as far as I'm concerned, the where you're going to have that high pressure, you need that relief. Now not to, not for the pipe, not to save the pipe, because this pipe could be sized so it's not going to break, but you're going to damage the pump. That's the issue. Not, you can build that pipe so it's. It's not going to work from the outlet, the outlet pressure. And you probably would. OK, a heat exchanger. First of all, whoa, what's going on here? So we have a shell and tube heat exchanger. And the hot fluid's going through the shell side. We've got the cold fluid going through the tube side. It's an even pass exchanger because it's going back and forth. So what do we have, what are these valves for? These are three manual valves, so you have to go out there and open them and close them. What do we have those extra three valves, what are they for? Yeah. 
Okay, it's a bypass loop, but why would we want to bypass the heat exchange? <laughs> well, when we want to clean it, for example. Okay, so I want to take it out of service. I'm going to have to clean this thing occasionally, mechanically, chemically. So, if I want to take this heat exchange out of service, but I still want this flow to keep going, because there may be other heat exchangers down here somewhere else. I need to be able to shut off the flow to the heat exchanger and then open this stream so that the stream can continue around. So we're going to put bypasses in a lot. We're going to see a lot more of them in flexibility later on. So this enables us to shut down the heat exchanger, do maintenance on it, and put it back in service. We can also shut it down if it's leaking. Okay. So we have the hot fluid on this side, we have the cold fluid on this side. Um, take 30 seconds. Where do we need pressure relief and why? And what kind of device? This is quite hot. 30 seconds. Talk to your friends fast. <coughs> We have the 
uh, sorry, the burst diaphragm, the safety valve, and then release. And we have a pressure indicator, a pressure sensor between the two of them. Not at the vessel, but between the two of them. What's going on here? It looks as though somebody had an uncle who sold valves. There was some kind of deal going on. So <laughs> buying all these valves. This is a good design. Take 30 seconds and talk to your friends. Why might you need this design? In some instances, in some cases. Talk to your friends. <laughs> Okay, let me give you a hint. The vessel is a reactor. The vessel is a reactor, and we're making um, a polymer in that reactor. It's an emulsion polymerization. Okay, what were what were some of the strengths? What were some of the, it looks as though we're putting these two together, so we must be trying to match different strengths. What was the strength of the burst diaphragm? High pressure. Sorry? High pressure. High, very high pressure, okay, but that's okay, so we'll say this is only running at five atmospheres, and so it's not high pressure. What other strength does it have? It's good for sticky situation. Yeah, so for, for, for corrosion and for complex fluids, slurries and sticky fluids, it's very good. But what's bad? When it opens, you've got to shut the pipe down immediately. So, we have a polymer reactor down here. Could be, we could have very bad stuff down here. So, <coughs> we, we'd like to use a safety valve, but we've got this stuff sloshing around in here, and that might splash up into the valve and form corrosion, and then the valve would be sealed and it would work properly. So, this, First diaphragm is protecting the safety valve. So if there's any, and there will be material coming <coughs> up here, it's, it's, it's not going to significantly affect this whole big burst diaphragm with this smooth surface. Okay. <coughs> so if we have acid or highly corrosive material, we use the first diaphragm to protect the safety valve. Now, if the burst diaphragm opens because of corrosion, we can't look inside the vessel. We don't know that's happened. Right? So if there's some corrosion, the burst diaphragm just gets corroded and it opens up. It's not protecting a safety valve anymore. How do we know that the burst diaphragm is open? Yeah, the pressure sensor. <coughs> we send people around the plant every day to look at this pressure sensor. If the pressure sensor says, this is now a high pressure, we don't expect a high pressure, it's the pressure of the reactor now, we know we have to shut the plant down, but we have some time. So we can wait a couple of days, we can wait until this batch is done, and then we'll shut the reactor down and replace this. We don't have to do it immediately. Okay. So we need this thing, so that if, if this barrier fails, we'll know it immediately. <coughs> if there is a a high pressure in the vessel, this will burst, and then we'll still and, and the and, and the safety valve will open and the material will go out. So this is a common design where we have materials down here that would compromise the safety valve. We're going to use the burst diaphragm to protect the safety valve from that material. How is it actually protecting it because the liquid is going to pass through the valve? Alright, but but it's it's not the, the material down here, the problem is, isn't that it'll fall out once. The problem is that if, if we just had the safety valve sitting here, it would be splashing up and it would build up over time. That's the issue. Now, if it, if it were some really thick, like 
hull, then we couldn't use this design. If we're something that actually wouldn't flow through the valve, then we have to do some kind of big safety. So you have to go through cleaning once this happens? Well, once, once this happens, then you're going to, yeah, you're going to have to replace this, and you're going to have to clean that valve to make sure that anything that got up there doesn't stay. Okay. So very common design. We wouldn't think of originally, but it makes sense. We're, met, we're getting the, the most, both the best designs. Uh, so if that was a liquid in the vessel that was going to freeze, so it wouldn't work after that? So your pressure indicator would tell you that the acidic <coughs> outcome is a liquid or a solid. Uh, so I'm thinking of right now liquid sulfur. We had big problems where it didn't wipe through a valve and there's nothing there to keep it liquid. It would freeze again and it just has a very big plug on the end or something. Uh, yeah, then you could use this. So yeah, we couldn't use this design. No. Yeah. And you probably even want to heat trace this pipe or something. Yeah, I think we ended up having every line in the pipe is now electric trace. Yeah, so, so that it never cools down. So, so if this material solidified when it cooled down, then you need to heat trace this pipe. The whole pipe until wherever you dump it. To make sure it doesn't. It's no good to get it halfway out, or halfway down the pipe, and then have it slip. Okay, there's the answers, but they're posted. Uh, just remember that for over, if we can have over pressure and under pressure, like a penicillin reactor, it could be over pressure, but then it, it was under pressure, and they didn't have any protection against the under pressure. So you can have. And these are. This is just the third type. Of this piece. Now there are two, now there are three. These are uh, buckling things. So these are little devices <coughs> that a certain force will break. So they're, they're the weak part of the device. If the pressure is too low, the buck, this buckling pin will break and it will suck the air in. And if, it, if it's too high, it will break here and suck the material. The material to be. Okay. Again, these are all posted. Uh, if you have a really big problem, you may have to have a relief device that moves the wall, right? So you can have a blow-up wall. And what do you put here? A school? No. school there. So down in Sarnia and then one of the shell plants, where they have this, this is sort of right near the, the river. And then they have a barrier so that somebody coming by in a boat can't get into the area where the blast might be. Okay, give me one more minute here. What do we do with this stuff? There's lots of different possibilities. If it's benign, we go to the environment. Steam and high pressure air and stuff like that. If for example, it contains some material that needs to go through wastewater treatment. You probably put it in a holding pond, and that means you have to design the holding pond and be prepared for that, and then, and then sort of lead it off slowly into the wastewater treatment plant. You don't put it in the sewer because the city waste treatment plant is going to get some big slug of stuff and that will kill the, the uh, microbes in the, in the water treatment plant and then you're really in trouble. Sometimes you can recycle back to the process, so some of the fuels and things like that you can recycle back. Sometimes you can recover it, you can recover part of the material. So this would be what's called a knockout drum and on Monday we're going to see an uh, uh, example of a knockout drum that didn't work very well. So maybe Maybe the vapor has to be burned. Immediate neutralization, the most commonest flare, but if it's acid or base, we are going to have to neutralize it. The toxic materials, we might be able to burn those toxic materials or capture them. Okay, so containment is important as far as engineering is concerned. Obviously, there's a big leak to put barriers in. Uh, we still have about two minutes of, of uh, containment stuff.